I think it should be fine now. Okay. So, good afternoon, and I'd like to thank the editor of Euroactive.sk, Irene Yenchova, for joining us now for this uh, discussion about renewable energy sector development, which is a part of the project supported by the International Visegrad Fund. And within this project framework, we try to share some experiences of EU members, the Visegrad four countries with Armenian policy makers and analytical community. And now I would like to give the floor to Councillor of the Slovak Embassy in Armenia, Mr. Pavel Popiak for a welcome address. Uh, please, the floor is yours. And I may turn the laptop so Irena, you will see. Okay. Back as well. Hello. This could be a red light. And yes, it should be turned on. It works or not? Yes, should be fine. Yes. So I will try, but I think that this front echo. Uh, yeah, well, perhaps without it. Just yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to take part in this uh, video conference uh, concerning renewable energy sources and their using in uh, Europe, in Armenia. Uh, Slovak Embassy was opened only one year uh, before, uh, then pandemia came and uh, unfortunately we, we uh, cannot be able to develop uh, the relations with uh, Armenia energy sector uh, deeply, but uh, we have already some contacts and uh, we started to develop some concrete ideas concerning uh, use of renewable, renewable energies also in Armenia and transfer of experience from Slovakia. Uh, energy sector is one of the main uh, objective of uh, one of priorities of uh, the activities of uh, Slovak Embassy in Armenia, together with others. But uh, we see that there is a great potential, especially in renewable uh, energy sources. Uh, the number of sunny days in Armenia is so high that uh, it would be pity to do not uh, develop this uh, possibility. And uh, we have already started to join the Slovak uh, partners with Armenian companies, and uh, we will do it also not only for uh, photovoltaic systems, but uh, we see that there is a potential also for uh, hydropower stations uh, in Armenia. Uh, I'm not speaking about uh, big hydropower station, but uh, there is possibility to develop also small uh, electricity plants on the Armenian uh, rivers. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, Embassy of the Slovak Republic to take part in this uh, discussion and uh, uh, I am looking forward to, for the cooperation, uh, not only in this field, but also in the future uh, with your institution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Popiak. And now, uh, 
I'm pleased to give the floor to Irena Yenchova, who joined us from Bratislava, and uh, we are looking forward to your presentation about Slovak experiences in this field. Um, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here today with you. Uh, my name is uh, Irena Jenčeva. Uh, I'm working as a journalist in uh, Aeroactive Slovakia, which is media portal uh, covering the political processes uh, on the European level uh, and in the connection to the national context of Slovak Republic. Uh, our main target groups are politicians, journalists, uh, and experts, but also NGOs and academia. And I'm focusing uh, on energy and environment. That's the reason why I was uh, invited uh, to this uh, presentation or discussion. Uh, before I start, I would like to encourage you to ask me the question and also ask for clarification. Maybe I, I will call, go over some issues more, more quickly. So if anything uh, will be not clear to you, uh, just ask me. And also I will be happy to find out um, some, something more about the energy situation in Armenia as well, because of my <laughs> professional profession. Okay, so uh, I'll make this a screen. Share screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. First, uh, I would like to present uh, you to you the main EU policies and initiatives, which are key to approach the discussion on the European level concerning energy and climate. Uh, there are ongoing really interesting initiatives uh, uh, in Europe that are providing space uh, for deploying uh, and uh, developing green energy solutions. Uh, after that, uh, I will briefly show you the situation in Slovakia concerning renewables, uh, and I will focus or I, I pick up uh, the two, two cases uh, where the EU legislation has an opposite impact uh, concerning the development of renewables in Slovakia. Okay, so five years ago, the European Union uh, ratified the Paris Agreement, uh, which established the goal to limit the rise in the global temperatures uh, this century to well below two degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial levels. Uh, what does it mean in practice? In practice, this entails reducing uh, global carbon emission from energy use to zero by 2050 and uh, maintaining uh, that level until the end of the century. So we have to slow down the climate change simply. We cannot stop it, we just can slow it down. Uh, this long-term decarbonization objectives has profound implication uh, for Europe climate and energy policies and objectives uh, in the 2030 and 2050 timeframe. So European countries have approved the early climate action uh, that the, um, they approved that the early climate action is a key uh, to ensure the efficient transition in all aspects of energy use, avoiding the need uh, for more dramatic uh, emission reduction after 2030. And what is also important to note, uh, they realize that it's uh, important to minimize uh, stranded assets, which practically means minimizing further investment to the fossil fuel or slightly phasing out, out of this um, direction. Uh, why we are we talking about the 2030 targets? Why is it so important the next uh, 10 years? Uh, according to UN climate panel, next decade will be crucial to stick to the Paris Agreement target and we need to accelerate the emission reduction during the next 10 years significantly 
in order to slow down the climate change. Uh, we are now uh, in a situation with, where the climate uh, targets of the European Union uh, was uh, were updated, uh, and uh, it was it was updated to 55% cut in greenhouse gas emission in compared to the 1990 level of the emission. So when I will be talking, when I will be talking during the whole presentation about the about the uh, European target, uh, the reference year uh, to the target is. 1990 because uh, it was uh, like where, where the uh, okay I will mention it later. Uh, concerning renewables, the target is is still like old target, uh, so I think it will be clarified this year uh, because the discussion is still ongoing about the renewable target. Um, but it's supposed to be well over 34% according to my assumptions. Uh, so that should be 34% of renewable energy in the EU energy mix. Uh, as the, so as the energy sector is responsible for approximately 30% uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions in Europe, uh, for the crucial, uh, next 10 years, the European Commission tabled the clean energy for all Europeans package in November 2016. Uh, the proposals uh, which were embodied in this um, policy package uh, have three main goals. Uh, the first one was uh, is putting energy efficiency first. Then the second one, achieving maximum deployment in renewable energies and providing a fair deal for a cons consumer. Uh, I would like to uh, stop a little bit uh, to in this third uh, pillar of uh, the new energy, uh, clean energy package. I would, uh, say, uh, I would call it like this, clean energy package. Uh, the third pillar of the package I found really important. Uh, and I would say pioneering, because the consumers shall become active and central players on the energy markets in the next decade. So uh, for me, this is a really like major positive change. Consumers across the EU in the, will in the future have a better choice of supply. Um, they will have uh, access to reliable energy price comparison tools, uh, for example, uh, for example, in a 10 years uh, uh, ahead from now, I will be able to decide whether I would like to have my electricity in my house, uh, for example, from solar uh, panels in, or photovoltaic panels in Spain or uh, wind uh, farms uh, in Denmark. So really the market will be open to the uh, cost, uh, consumers' decisions. Uh, but what I found really important uh, in this third pillar is the possibility to produce and sell uh, own electricity. So uh, this is the like major major shift of how we perceive the, the energy. Uh, now uh, the possibility is open to the consumers to be also producers. So uh, the word which is using uh, by the European Commission is prosumer. Okay, so, so it is consu consumer who is uh, producing uh, energy. Uh, the clean energy for all Europeans package uh, cover energy efficiency, renewable energy, design of the electricity market, security and electricity supply and governance rules for the energy union. And I will go now briefly uh, talk about uh, this, uh, uh, these areas which are embodied in, in this package. Uh, buildings are responsible for approximately 40% of energy consumption and 36% of CO2 emission in the European Union making them the single largest energy consumer in Europe. 
So European uh, Commission really stressed the importance of renovation, of complex renovation of buildings and set uh, binding targets uh, to reach uh, this goal. Uh, by improving energy performance in building, the EU can more readily achieve its energy and climate goals. Um, with a view to showing uh, global leadership in uh, energy uh, on, on renewables, the EU has set an ambitious binding target, as I mentioned before, 32 percent uh, for renewable energy sources. But um, this target, I guess, will be uh, will be higher um, as the climate targets of European. Uh, union are higher now after the December 2020. Mm, putting energy efficiency first is a key objective in the package, as energy savings are the easiest way of saving money for consumers and for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. For example, in Slovakia, uh, there is really um, many energy a lot of energy loss is happening um, in the um, district um, heating systems for example uh, there are maybe there is a, approximately one third of the all energy produced in slovakia or used in slovakia is just burning out of the space so really um, energy efficiency uh, will be also crucial uh, for the Slovakia emission targets and also for Slovakia renewable targets. The package includes a robust governance system for the energy union under which each member state is required to establish integrated 10 years, 10 year national energy and climate plan for, for the next decade, actually. Uh, based on the common structure, the these plans outline how EU countries will achieve their respective targets on all dimensions of the energy union, including a longer term view towards 2050. A further part of the package seeks to establish a modern design for the EU electricity market. Uh, adopted to the new realities to the market, more flexible, more market oriented, uh, as I said before, uh, people will be able to shift, uh, for example, the producer of the energy, which is not uh, happening now in Slovakia, for example, when you want to shift the producer of the energy uh, as a household, uh, there are many obstacles, obstacles, even financial obstacles, uh, if you want to do, do so. Um, okay, so, so we briefly, uh, we briefly overview the clean energy package, and um, now we, we. I would like to like introduce you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you know about the, the development in uh, in the uh, in Europe, EU. But really, I would like to stress uh, this uh, flagship climate policy uh, movement. I would say uh, in Europe. Uh, which is called the European Green Deal, uh, which is called European Green Deal. And the European Commission, when, when the European Commission presented the European Green Deal in Decem December 2019, uh, Commission outlined a long list of policy initiatives aim, aimed at putting Europe on track to reach net zero, glo zero global warming emission by 2050. Uh, Commission President Ursula von der, for der, uh, von der Leyen outlined that she will ensure, or the Commission will ensure that no one will be left behind in the race to achieve a climate neutral economy 2050. Uh, this is the Europe's man on the moon moment, she said. Our goal is to reconcile the economy with our planet. Uh, and she describing climate policy as Europe's new growth strategy. So this climate, uh, this European Green Deal is really 
now in the center of the of the policy development in Euro, Europe in every every possible areas. Uh, Europe wants to be a front runner uh, in climate friendly friendly industries and clean technologies. Uh, so uh, the the according to the uh, president of the Commission, the old growth model based on fossil fuels and pollution is out of date. Okay, I will briefly introduce you uh, uh, 10 main points uh, of European Green Deal. Uh, it's really covering all the possible areas uh, of the economy. Uh, first of all, there is a goal uh, to reach a climate neutral Europe in 2050. This is overarching objective of the European Green Deal. The EU will aim to reach net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050. A goal was approved by the member states in a climate law. And now in December, and now there, is a, there are ongoing negotiations between European Commission, Council and the Parliament. Uh, that means Updating the EU's climate ambition for 2030 with 55% cut in grass, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to replace the current 40% objective. Uh, so we have this objective 55%. The negotiations uh, between Parliament and Council will be uh, maybe uh, difficult because uh, Parliament wants to reach uh, 60%. Uh, of greenhouse gas uh, cut of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and according to the scientific uh, findings we supposed to reduce the greenhouse gas emission uh, of 65% uh, so uh, even even uh, the Europe is really ambitions is uh, not uh, it's not uh, correspond to the scientific uh, findings. Uh, the Commission plans to review every EU law and regulation in order to align them with the new climate goals. Uh, this will start with the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, which I will be mentioning uh, later on. Uh, all possible di directive, energy efficiency directive, emission trading directive, and so on. Uh, Commission also planned for smart sector integration, bringing together the electricity, gas and heating sector, sector closer in one system. Okay, uh, the second pillar of the European Green Deal, but very, very impro important, is a circular economy. Uh, a new circ circular economy action plan uh, was introduced uh, in March last year. But after, after COVID came, everything changed. Uh, so now it, uh, it will be revised uh, during the, the next months. Um, and I think the more stricter um, targets and goals will be set. Uh, European Parliament is uh, pretty um, initiative in this, uh, in this matter. Uh, this new circular economy action plan was introduced as a part of broader EU industrial strategy. Uh, so carbon intensive industries like uh, steel, cement and textiles or, or chemicals will also focus on the attention under the new, under these new circular policies. Uh, one key objective is to prepare for st clean steel making using hydrogen by 2030. Um, and the question is why 2030 is so important again? Uh, and the answer is because if you want clean industry in 2050, 2030 is the last investment cycle. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this bunch of policies also includes uh, um, strategies for batteries, strategies for raw materials as well. So it, it will be really like complex, uh, complex uh, set of policies. Um, 
um, the flagship or as commission put it, the flagship of the Green Deal is uh, building renovation, as I mentioned before. Uh, so the key objective in this matter is to at least double or even triple the renovation rate of buildings, which currently stands at around 1% per year. So in 2030, there should be uh, the renovation rate of 3% per year. Uh, whether in air, soil or water, the objective is to reach a pollution free environment. Uh, by 2050, uh, 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 new initiatives there include a chemical strategy for a toxic free <clears throat> environment. So, so, so completely new approach uh, to where toxics, uh, toxic um, chemicals. Uh, new biodiversity strategy, uh, it was presented in March uh, 2020 uh, with a message that uh, Europe wants to lead by example uh, with new measure to address the main drivers of biodiversity loss and uh, that includes also measures to tackle soil and water pollution as well as a new forest strategy. Uh, some officials said we need more trees in Europe, both in the in cities and in the countryside. Uh, new labeling rules will be tabled to promote deforestation free agricultural products. Um, this, uh, as I, I will be talking about this later, but um, this biodiversity strategy is not always in accordance with other uh, policies of Europe. For example, the policies concerning renewables. Uh, as soon as uh, the biomass uh, production or biomass burning is still considerable, considered as renewable. So I can see here a little bit like clash uh, between these two uh, policy uh, directions. The new strategy uh, on agriculture is called farm to fork strategy. And it, it is aiming for a green and healthy agriculture systems, including uh, the reduction of the, the reduction, the use of chemical pesticides, fertilizers and antibiotics. Also new national strategic plans due to be submitted somewhere this year uh, by member states under the common agriculture, agriculture policy will be scrutinized to see whether they are aligned with the objective of the Green Deal. Uh, transport is a huge, uh, huge topic uh, now in Europe and uh, um, Euro uh, European Commission uh, with its uh, policy is targeting mainly the automotive sector. Uh, the current objective, uh, or not, not the current objective, but after the beginning of this year, uh, the cars should not emit more than 95 grams CO2 per kilometers. Uh, which is kind of problematic in terms of uh, if, if they are not uh, um, electric cars, uh, because average car, normal new car with a uh, combustion engine uh, emits uh, around 150 grams CO2 per kilometer, per kilometer. So it's really <laughs> impossible to reach uh, this um, target. So what, what's happening now, the, the only cars which are reaching this target are electric cars. So what's happening is that um, uh, automotive sectors is moving towards uh, more like electric car, car production. production. Uh, so electric v, uh, cars will be further encouraged with an objective of deploying 1 million public charging points across Europe by 2025. 
the another topic uh, in the transport uh, sector uh, are sustainable altern alternative fuels, biofuels and hydrogen. Especially hydrogen uh, is a mm, kind of uh, considered to be a silver bullet uh, to the all um, like energy issues in Europe uh, and in the transport sector will be promoted, the hydrogen will be promoted in aviation, shipping and heavy duty road transport mainly, mainly in the areas where electrification is currently not possible. I think there are some first uh, hydrogen train uh, in Germany, but really is it really for, for now it's very premature uh, technology. Uh, the commission proposes a just transition mechanism in order to feel full, fulfill the, 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 the main like message of the European Green Deal that no one will be left behind. Uh, so commission proposed this just transition mechanism to help regions more heavily dependent on fossil fuels to overcome the burden of phasing out the fossil fuels and to transport toward, toward low carbon economy. Uh, in Slovakia, we have uh, a region, uh, upper Nitra region, uh, which is heavily dependent on lignite mining and production and heating. So uh, this upper Nitra was among the first region who uh, that like, uh, applied uh, for this for the money from this fund, uh, just transition fund, and um, the transition is really happening. It seems that uh, the end of coal in this region will come sooner than in 2023, uh, and uh, it's a very complex um, policy. Uh, which contains, for example, not only like reschooling the, the miners, but also it, uh, it has a complex overview over the whole region. For example, in terms of transport, how the uh, former miners could, uh, could travel for the next region to, to, uh, uh, to, to work. So, so it's really like a complex exercise. Um, this uh, just transition mechanism. And, oh, okay. Uh, what is important, especially in Slovakia, uh, that regions will, be, will also be offered technical assistance in order to help them absorb the funds, which is a huge problem in Slovakia. We have really high uh, number of, of not absorbing of, for example, EU funds or other uh, financial instruments uh, provided by the European Union. Of course, uh, we have to mention the research and development and innovation. Uh, we, what, is an, in, in, what is interesting is that 35% uh, of EU's research funding will be set aside for climate friendly technologies. Um, okay, uh, the final point, uh, which is uh, important, very important concerning the external relations of European Union. Uh, EU diplomatic efforts will be mobilized in support of the Green Deal. One measure likely to attract the attention and controversy uh, and I will be happy uh, to, uh, uh, during the discussion, I'll be happy to find out more about your opinion on this, uh, is a proposal for carbon border tax. Uh, as Europe increases its uh, climate ambition, we expect the rest of the world to play its role too. Uh, and you official explain, but if not, Europe is not going to be naive and will protect its industry against unfair competition. His idea. So, uh, what does it mean in practice? It means uh, that when, uh, uh, for example, China would like to 
which, uh, for example, China that has uh, almost no environmental or social standards uh, set, uh, want to import the lead uh, uh, to, uh, to Europe. Uh, it will, the China will have two possibilities. Uh, the first one is to pay some, uh, some respective cost uh, of the environmental damage, I would say, uh, on the border of European Union. On the say, or, or the second option is to uh, to raise its own climate targets and environmental standards. So uh, we can perceive it as a uh, as a tool of climate di diplomacy of European Union. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hope that I'm not uh, very boring with this uh, policy overview, but I uh, have to really mention uh, the last one uh, and it's uh, next generation EU. Uh, so, so the Green Deal was uh, approved uh, uh, and adopted uh, by the member states in de December 2019. And then the COVID came and uh, everything changed. And uh, after the heat of the pandemic, Commission soon started to talk about the recovery plan. But uh, the clean, clear message was that we supposed to building back better. So, um, the recovery plan for Europe is a temporary instrument, financial instrument that's supposed to help repair the economic and social damage caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, coupled with the EU's long-term budget, next generation EU is designing, designed to boost the recovery and will be the largest stimulus package ever. Uh, financed through the EU budget. A total of uh, 1.8 trillion euros will help rebuild the post-COVID-19 Europe. So the Europe will be greener, more digital and more resilient. If you look at uh, the main uh, measures, uh, I would like to point out that, uh, for example, 37% of resources contribute climate action, should contribute to the climate action and environmental sustainability. Uh, so when Slovakia is now considering and is now creating the, the plan of the reforms that will be financed through this mechanism, uh, the commission uh, it, it, uh, the Slovakia have to really like prove to the commission that uh, this percentage of the green project and green investments will be, will be there. So it's another window of opportunity for Slovakia to accelerate uh, the development of renewables. Okay, so uh, now I would like to have a uh, a uh, brief overview of the of the recent uh, development of the energy uh, of the um, situation in the energy EU energy sector. Um, uh, during the last five years, key renewable technologies such as solar, photovoltaics, and offshore offshore wind have achieved spectacular cost reduction exceeding expectations, both in terms of their speed and extent. Technological development has also accelerated in end use sectors. For example, uh, electric cars are quickly reaching commercial maturity and could play a role in the deployment uh, of larger shares of renewables in EU by 2030. Uh, Okay, let's look at the numbers. Um, coal generation collapsed by 24 percent in the EU in 2019. Uh, all these numbers are uh, connected to the 2019. Uh, hard coal generation dropped by 32 percent, while lignite decreased by 16 percent. 
This development is driven by the CO2 price increases and deployment of renewables. Uh, so, uh, so, so European um, emission trading system uh, has a huge uh, role in this uh, decline of the coal. Uh, gas replaced around half of the coal, uh, solar and wind uh, other half. Uh, the decline of coal will continue. Greece and Hungary both made commitments in 2019 to phase out coal, bringing the total of member states phasing out coal to 15. Only Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, and Croatia are yet to start. Uh, I think this is also changed. Uh, maybe this is a little bit old data. Uh, also, also because because the the phasing out uh, uh, fossil or phasing out coal program is one of the precondition uh, to to be part of the uh, recovery package. So. Uh, I think this already has changed. The fall in coal means CO2 emissions in Europe, power sector, fell by a record uh, of 12% 12, uh, 12 in 2019. Uh, this is likely to be the largest ever fall. Uh, we, we will see uh, what happened in 2020 because of the COVID situation. Uh, Overall emission covered by the EU European trading uh, um, emission trading system are falling much faster than the cap, showing the central law, law, role of uh, further strengthening of EU ETS to accelerate climate action in Europe. So, uh, as I mentioned, the price of the CO2 emissions is rising. This is happening only recently. For example, two years ago, the price uh, of the tone of the CO2 emissions was only uh, 20 uh, euros. Now um, it is um, over the 35 euros per ton. So, so it's really like um, the, the role of this ETS system is really like accelerating and started to play a important um, role in the climate um, policies. Uh, renewables rose to a new record, supplying 35% of EU electricity. And for the first time, wind and solar combined provide more electricity than coal, contributing 18% of EU electricity in 2019. This is more than a double, doubling, uh, doubling of market share since 2013. Uh, so, so the market, we can see the market is really... Um, um, improving. The increase of in wind and solar generation was strongest uh, in uh, Western Europe, while Poland and Greece have started to engage. The rest of the Eastern Europe is significantly lag lagging behind. Uh, the economic opportunities of low-cost renewables become increasingly visible. Uh, really, the technologies are uh, less expensive. Uh, uh, significantly. Uh, 2019 saw record low auction prices for offshore, offshore wind in UK and solar for Portugal below wholesale prices and the largest wholesale price decreases in countries where wind and solar expanded most. <clears throat> okay. So where we are now in Europe concerning the renewable targets and energy. So as I said, the current target for 2030 is 32% and it will be probably rise. Uh, in 2019, the EU reached uh, almost 20% share of renewables in final energy consumption, uh, which, uh, which is uh, the, the, the target for 2020 is 20%. So it's only 0.3 percentage points uh, below. 
uh, 14 member states sur surpassed their national targets for 2020, with six very close to meeting them. Uh, here is Slovakia. And you can see the Slovakia easily or jump over its own renewable target, which is uh, very optimistic. But I will uh, then later explore how this uh, happened. Okay. Another optimistic uh, projection I will introduce uh, to you. Uh, according to Irena, uh, by which I don't mean to myself, I'm Irena as well, but I mean International Renewable Energy Agency. According to their analysis, there is an addition, additional potential to reach 24, 34% uh, in a cost effective manner. So now uh, the, the, policy, the, the, uh, the uh, policies in, in Europe are set in a way that without any additional effort, we can easily reach 34% in 2030. Even before considering the very significant economic value of the associated health and environmental benefits. According to this analysis, faster deployment of renewables by 2030 is technically feasible with today's technologies, which is very important because um, European Commission in many scenarios is counting on hydrogen and hydrogen is really nowadays a premature technology. So uh, this scenario is counting on the technology, uh, technologies which are all already there. Okay, so it will bring many benefits if uh, we would uh, deploy more renewables, uh, said Irena. Um, accelerated the depl deployment of renewables would have much broader social benefits for the EU and its member states, create new jobs. So this is very important concerning renewable energy, um, boost economic activity, and moreover, the decentralized nature of many renewable energy technologies and the increased uptake of domestic biomass production uh, under this scenario could be a driver for economic development among structurally weak regions and rural areas. Okay. Let's go to Slovakia. So uh, now I, I will like make a brief overview about the situation and then we'll, uh, we will come to the two cases I would like to, to uh, show you. Uh, and then will be discussion. Okay. Supply and demand of the Slovak Republic's energy system is characterized by high share of nuclear power. Uh, I check also, um, I check the energy portfolio of Armenia, I think uh, it's a uh, kind of similar. There is a huge uh, amount of nuclear energy in Armenia and also a huge amount of hydro. Uh, Slovakia is uh, kind of similar. Uh, the share of nuclear power in Slovakia accounts for 60% of domestic energy production and the largest part of the total primary energy supply. Uh, domestic nuclear energy production uh, helps improve energy security in Slovak Republic, which otherwise dependent on the large fossil fuel imports, mainly from Russia. But on the other hand, uh, nuclear, um, we need Russia uh, to, to provide us with nuclear, uh, how is it called? <laughs> I forget. Uh, the country has a large industrial sector, uh, which accounts for over 40% of total final consumption. Natural gas, oil, and electricity are the main energy sources. Uh, Slovak Republic also has an extensive district heating system, fueled maybe, uh, mainly with natural gas and increasingly biofuels. We have fast growing, um, um, fast -growing uh, automotive manufacturing industry. In fact, Slovakia is uh, producing uh, uh, the highest uh, number of cars per person in Europe. So 
really automotive industry is uh, very important. Okay, I change it. Uh, industry accounts for over 40% of total final consumption in the country. Remaining energy consumption is in the transport sector, 24% and residential sector 20, commercial sector 14%. Uh, I, I will come back. As you can see, um, oh, okay, let's say what's this. Is, huh? uh, the emission and energy consumption uh, in transport sec sector is increasing uh, steadily. But on the other, uh, in the other sectors, uh, for example, the residential sector, the consumption decreased by 12%, and in commercial sex sector, the consumption decreased by 28% of the overall energy need. Okay, as I said, uh, Slovak Republic uh, continues uh, to have an not only energy mix, but also electricity mix dominated by low carbon sources with its base load largely met uh, by nuclear power and hydropower. Uh, the share of renewable energy has increased also the government's vision for the future. A role of specific renewable technologies is not clear. Uh, industry is the largest uh, electricity consumer in the country. Uh, the Slovak Republic has increased uh, its interconnections with neighboring countries and a large amount of electricity is traded on the regional market. Uh, there is a very important uh, connection and new transmission line with Hungary. Uh, it's supposed to be um, uh, like uh, ready this year. And um, this is uh, this this interconnection is according to the distributors and stakeholders a uh, crucial uh, precondition for a further uh, development of renewables in Slovakia. Okay, so let's move uh, to the uh, case number one. Um, I, I will briefly introduce you to the situation of renewables in Slovakia uh, and what's, what's going on here because the development is not, um, not <laughs> satisfactory. Um, so uh, operational support, support has always been the main driver for the development of uh, renewable sources in general. Historically, electricity production from renewables was supported by the feed-in tariff scheme under which uh, renewable sources, producers, sell electricity for fixed price that are higher than those of conventionally produced electricity. Um, in 2009, the Slovak Republic introduced a technology-specific uh, feed-in tariffs for solar uh, as the main support instrument for renewable electricity generation. The tariffs now are valid for 15 years, so uh, they will last, this guarantee of prices will last until 2025. Um, the level of feed-in tariffs depends on the year in which the project was put into the operation. So uh, to, to make a more uh, like to be more concrete, uh, the fixed price for solar uh, in 2009 was uh, 430 euro megawatts uh, per hour. So it was a good business to be that time in the solar business in Slovakia. Uh, so solar power was initially subsidized at a high level. And as the total subsidies were not capped, uh, they soon ballooned out of control. After there was unblocked 120 megawatt grid capacity for renewables, uh, 
for renewable plants uh, in 2009. Uh, this capacity was used up within only three days. <clears throat> only three days. Many of the potential investors were in fact speculators, which blocked the offered grid capacity and subsequently began to sell the capacities to the to the real <laughs> to the real uh, renewable source uh, investors. The government reacted by demanding, for example, by demanding a building permit for all uh, RES uh, projects exceeding 100 kilowatts, which still recently uh, constitute a severe problem for investors. Uh, similar costly policy failures uh, were witnessed early this decade in other countries as well. Uh, to limit the damage, the government slashed the subsidy uh, to 44 uh, euros per megawatt uh, hour, which in hindsight was the right thing, thing to do. Uh, so what happened next is that system operators stopped in 2013 accepting request for connecting renewables about 10 kilowatts uh, to the distribution grid simply uh, because of concerns of grid stability and security of supply. Uh, these regulatory measures are st still applies uh, and an official reason however is the historical debt there, there there was really like there is now the, the huge debt uh, because the high prices uh, were paid by the, on the one, one hand, by the final consumers, uh, on the other hand, uh, by the distribution companies. So now the state uh, has debt uh, to the distribution companies of uh, 300 uh, millions of euro. So we, now we have this stop, um, uh, stop status situation. Uh, what lessons could, could be learned out of this? Uh, that concerning incentives and subsidies, it's important to apply a predictable and transparent monitoring process for support costs and to analyze regularly the effectiveness and to adjust for future facilities, uh, or preferably introduce other system than uh, direct uh, incentives, for example, tenders or auctions. So, so, so what is the situation now in Slovakia? Um, in theory, all producers of electricity from renewable sources uh, in the Slovak Republic are entitled to take advantage of preferential access to the distribution system and preferential transmission, distribution and supply. But the reality has proved rather different. Uh, the, in recent years, distribution companies have been very reluctant to connect new installation, especially solar arguing that the national grid does not have sufficient, sufficient capacity. Uh, but this argument um, was kind of declined by the Slovak Photovoltaic Association, who claims that the share of re variable uh, renewables capacity is still very low in the grid and does not pose a threat to the stability of the grid. Okay, so... so the distribution companies are saying that uh, the connection is either technically impossible or the whole process is severely delayed. Uh, the waiting time can, can be around more than one year. Uh, in spite of these challenges uh, in the renewable sector in Slovakia, uh, promising signal suggests that maybe Slovakia will write its policy framework for renewables and EU funds will play an integral role and also maybe uh, the next generation EU instruments as well. Uh, the Ministry of Environment and the Slovak Innovation and Energy Agency have begun distributing EU funds for photovoltaics, phototermic, 
heat pumps and sustainable biomass boilers up to 10 kilowatts. So, so still very small sources in a program called Green to the Household. Uh, Green to the Household. And uh, there is a huge interest in this program. So, so um, in a few minutes, all the <laughs> capacity is gone uh, for one year. So to sum up, uh, the increase of renewable electricity supply was not um, uh, was not a policy priority, partly because the available hydropower capacity is already in use, and wind, solar, and geothermal power for the moment require significant subsidies to be widely exploited. Uh, low carbon sources already generate eighty percent when we include nuclear of electricity, electricity and country has a significant generating capacity over peak demand. Okay, but uh, in 2020, the situation slightly changed because uh, the new government uh, entered uh, into, into force <laughs> and uh, was elected and the government has announced a plan with strong support for renewable energy sources with an aim to reduce bureaucracy, make the support schemes for transparent and application process less complex. Uh, this can hopefully bring cheaper electricity prices from renewable sources <clears throat> for end consumers. Uh, but uh, the most significant upgrade of the situation was, without any doubts, uh, the introduction of green auctions for new installations uh, to be organized by the Ministry of Economy in accordance with the EU guidelines. So, so we can see that the, 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 there is a, some effort to open the, the market uh, of electricity in Slovakia according to the clean energy package. Um, in February 2020, it was announced the first green auction for a new installation with capacity up to 30 megawatts with guaranteed feed in premium tariffs for 15 years. So again, uh, it was feed in tariff. Um, and ministry has set the maximum prices which can be offered in the auction. For solar and wind energy, the maximum price was 84 euro per megawatt hour. And for the rest, the amount was 106 per megawatt hour. But uh, what is most important is that as a solution to the stop status problem, the auction rule imposed an obligation on the distribution companies to connect the winning installation to the national grid. So, um, after some uh, company will win this auction, uh, the distribution company is obliged to, to connect uh, it to the grid, uh, which is still not happening <laughs> because COVID came. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 situation, the fir this first auction has been cancelled. Uh, however, the ministry is planning to relaunch uh, action it was like end of the last year. Now it's moving to the first quartal of the of the 2021. So we will see. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, in the in, in in next year or in this year, the stop stuff really stop statue uh, status uh, for renewables really like come to the end. Uh, because the Slovak government has no choice than to open the market if uh, the Slovak government will adapt uh, the directives of the open market or the, uh, the, all the directives coming from the clean energy package. And it shall be adopted into the Slovak legislation till June. Uh, so there is a big rush uh, on the ministry and also, also uh, on the side of the distributors of the grid operators. So everybody is preparing, everything is preparing for, uh, for the implementation of this uh, clean energy package.
Mm. So for, for Slovakia, as I know, um, as I know, for example, my friends or people, uh, the really important things I mentioned earlier is that uh, this package will bring really uh, the possibility uh, for production and sell uh, selling the own electricity I produce on my roof. So, so this is uh, really like I, I'm really shift in uh, in a way we are thinking about energy also in Slovakia. So this was the uh, example where the European legislation has a really positive role in the attitude of government. Uh, but uh, in the second uh, case I chose for you, it will it was rather opposite. Um, the European Renewable Directive was launched in uh, 2009 uh, to great fanfare and the promise that EU would fulfill at least 20% of its total energy needs with renewables. So the target was set clearly. Uh, few could have guessed that the policy intended to help the EU meet climate goals would lead to vast increase in the burning of wood, degradating forests in Europe and beyond. Uh, so because the, this directive, uh, uh, the, the directive uh, like approved the biomass burning as a, a renewable uh, source of energy or the biomass was uh, approved as a, a sustainable source of energy. What happened next that it was like great uh, burning and logging in Slovakia. So it resulted in unsustainable use of biomass in certain regions of Slovakia, where high quality wood is cut and still until now and burned for energy purposes. Uh, the Slovak Environmental Agency concluded that between 90s and 2011, logging exceed the bearable amount. The share of solid biomass was 45% of total renewables in primary energy supply in 2017. Logging grew uh, by at least 70% uh, between 90s and 2015. So in 15 years, the logging grew at least by 75%. Slovakia lost almost 6% of forest cover between 2001, 2001 and 2014. Moreover, heating with low efficiency combustion equipment for burning solid fuels, including biomass, contributes uh, the most to high concentration of particulate matter. Uh, so it also, the, the air quality was harmed uh, because of this uh, direction. Uh, in recent years, uh, plants using combined heat and power technology have been rebu rebu rebuilding uh, boilers to burn biomass with coal and building new boilers to burn biomass. And this trend will continue. There are plans to increase the installed capacity of solid biomass utilities from 100 megawatts in 2020 to 200 megawatts in 2030. And and disproportionately increase the gross amount of electricity produced from, from it. Um, this will make the overcutting of forests uh, and other sources of biomass even worse. Uh, and the problem, uh, the main problem is uh, the absence of sustainability criteria uh, in the European um, directive, but also in Slovak law, I mean, it's not the I'm not accusing the European Union. We just use this directive and the uh, loopholes in it. Uh, and so it resulted in spending a huge amount of EU funding on building large scale uh, wood 
based heat and power plants, both communal and industrial. Uh, now, one interesting things. I hope you, you can, I'm, I'm sorry for the bad quality of the, of the picture. Um, uh, but what happened? If you are uh, looking, this huge amount of biomass consumption, of this huge uh, biomass consumption was not uh, count uh, in the European statistics. So if you can see this line, you can see the the uh, that share of uh, renewables is slightly rising during the years, uh, and this was like the um, the, the statistical uh, year, which was like this. This was like presumption. Then the the target we will uh, the, the I'm sorry, <laughs> the share of re renewables in 2020. Uh, will be 14% of the total energy mix. But what happened uh, in the statistic, you can see it here, that this is the, like the real numbers. And from 2018 to 2019, there is suddenly a huge step, uh, a huge jump leap uh, in, a, in the statistic. So what happened, this was a kind of a, really like resonates uh, during the last months in Slovakia, because suddenly, if, we, if, you, if you look at the, this number, it's 11, or almost 12%. And the target for the 2020 is 14%. So we were, we were behind our targets formally in 2019, and now suddenly in 2018, uh, uh, and now suddenly in 2019, we are able our target. So we are on almost 17% and we're supposed to be on 14%. And what happened is that uh, the statistical office of the uh, Slovak Republic um, made a uh, research among the households uh, and found out that uh, there is a huge amount of households which is burning a huge amount of biomass uh, which was not surprising, but now we can see it uh, in numbers. So, so what I want to show you or uh, illustrate you is that uh, we are um, suddenly uh, fulfilled the 2020 renewable uh, energy share targets, but in a cost of really deforestation uh, and burning biomass in Slovakia. Okay, thank you for your attention, uh, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Irena. And uh, I would uh, perhaps make some comments. Well, uh, energy structure, yes, also in Armenia, we have a large part of energy produced uh, by nuclear power plant, it's about 40% uh, in our case, and another 40 is gas, however. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, Armenia is also a net exporter of electricity, thanks to gas powered plants. But, uh, so in Slovakia, it's 60% nuclear, about 20 hydro, and then uh, some 17 gas, if I remember correctly. Uh Yes, uh, I can. I can. Uh, uh, but but this hydro, it's like um, a large hydro, which were which was built in uh, uh, in the seventies uh, from the previous century. So so it is not like a new hydro are not so common, and I'm yeah. happy for that. <laughs> yeah, but the energy losses you mentioned in heating, it's mostly uh, so coming from gas. So. Yeah, so, gas and uh, recently for lignite. Panel building mostly. Like, I'm sorry? Panel buildings mostly, I guess, water boiled somewhere and transferred there by pipes. So uh, the highest losses probably are, are in that part. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the centralized uh, heat. Uh, yeah, those the buildings, thing. even the after getting new isolation, they still have low efficiency, like COD level. So they never reach A or A plus or 
even be, I guess. Yeah, uh, they have a very limited uh, life cycle as well. So even after the, but but we have no no other option than to insulate them and to raise their um, energy efficiency. Yes, and what about the share of renewables? Uh, so in the EU, Sweden and Finland had the highest, but. Even higher was the level in Norway and Iceland, non EU members, but so they are not so rich in solar energy. So, uh, do they have some use of tidal energy or maybe geysers in Iceland as well? How do they reach oh, that? I'm, I'm not very <laughs> expert on, on the Iceland energy. I guess, I, I, I guess the, the majority of the Iceland energy comes from the geothermal sources. Uh, okay. Yeah, and uh, and uh, recently I wrote an article about the Denmark, uh, which is going to build a really huge uh, wind farms in the sea, not on the off on shore, but uh, in the sea, and they are really uh, in the Denmark intended to be climate neutral, I guess, in 2035. So really, really, they, some some countries are really much further. Uh, and they intend to build uh, a floating island where all these wind turbines will be and it will be produced a uh, huge amount of electricity for 300,000 households a day. So it's uh, really like th this, this offshore winds or, or the, the sea wind farms are on the rise in the European Union. Uh, as well as the solar and photovoltaics, of course. Yeah, so wind farms in the sea are also a big deal in Germany now, I suppose. Yeah, or onshore, yes. So, uh, so also, also the policies are are are, are coping this uh, this this development, and there will be another strategy for uh, the um, wind farm uh, wind farm industry, let's say, and the connectivity of the grid of the energy union of the European Union is really important because as we know the the wind some sometimes it's it is but sometimes it's not so uh, the 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 flexibility and smart grids are really crucial for for the deployment of these new renewables yes. And I was a bit maybe surprised about the, the issue of deforestation in Slovakia. So uh, I didn't quite expect that the EU directives or incentives could be used that way. Yeah, the, the, this uh, European directive on renewables, uh, it uh, has um, received many critics from the beginning because it um, not only it cost deforestation in countries like Slovakia and inland countries, but also um, in uh, Indonesia or elsewhere, because uh, it set a benchmark uh, for the, for example, fuels for cars, uh, the benchmark, what is the level of bio, uh, no, the, the share of the bio um, part uh, in the fuel. So, the countries were in fact pushed by the directive to fulfill the target and uh, they helped <laughs> themselves and really this caused the huge deforestation also in elsewhere uh, in the in the world not only in europe <laughs> so 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 when uh, when considering i'm sorry we have some over regulation issue in this case uh, again please oh. Over regulation or no, no, no. We, 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 I think we have to set some uh, sustainable criteria for uh, biomass using, and uh, I hope uh, that now it's a huge movement um, among public, among people in Slovakia, uh, and the the issues is really like vibrant now uh, in Slovakia public space and discourse uh, that we supposed to stop the 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 logging. Uh, in this in this scale, because it's and we are not only using the uh, the our forests and the biomass, but we are also exporting it. And this is uh, this is really like um, 
not uh, receiving not good <laughs> attitudes from from people you know uh, well we also got the deforestation issue but it's more trivial in our case because it's not biofuel just because of the monopoly on gas supply and distribution and also overpriced energy and electricity also overpriced because of that so people just cut some trees and heat their houses uh -huh. so so the gas is too expensive for people yeah it's uh, monopolized okay. and uh, electricity as well yeah, this happened to also to slovakia slovakia has a really huge uh, uh, um, like a system of pi uh, gas pipelines uh, which was built back in the 90s uh, almost uh, like 90 percent of the of the land is uh, covered and uh, really this is similar uh, to the development in Slovakia that people are cut their uh, themselves from the from the pipeline and uh, burn biomass instead yes, and, uh, uh, you also mentioned that the EU intends to protect the industry against unfair competition and uh, regarding China, because that's like an elephant in the room. Yes. Yeah, because uh, also with the target year set 1990, that was plus minus the year when China's explosive growth started. Mm -hmm. so a large contribution to carbon dioxide emission was made by China later by, by India and some others as well. But uh, the EU hasn't been increasing its consumption of fossil fuels at such an exponential rate, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a kind of topic also for the um, uh, inside European industry because they want, I mean, the, the representatives of the industry, they want to, they, they want definitely this border tax. Uh, they say they want to, uh, the like the same field level play field playing field uh, as uh, the importers but on the other hand uh, the eu industry is receiving uh, quotas for the emissions so they could um, emit uh, emit for free in some extent uh, they are receiving quotas from the government uh, so uh, the proposal from the Commission about this carbon border tax is that, okay, we will introduce the carbon border tax, but on the other hand, we will, we will not give you uh, the emission quotas uh, for free, because uh, from the point of view of the World Trade Organization, this could be perceived as uh, like uh, protection measures, which is not legal. So, so, so now is the discussion is going on this year, and we will we will see what 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 happened next. <laughs> yeah, and considering the share of car making industry in Slovakia, is there a strategy for phasing out internal combustion engines by Volkswagen, Kia, and other producers, and other in incentives for developing the production of hybrid or electric cars? and also other incentives in developing renewable energy sector? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, this is a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, automotive sector in Slovakia has, in a, has a large, uh, large uh, power uh, in Slovakia. And they, the problem is that uh, Kia is not resigning, residing in Slovakia. It's residing in the uh, South Korea. So maybe in a cent or Volkswagen in Germany. So so they have their own plans uh, plans how to phasing out uh, the combustion engines, but uh, they they would do it uh, more in Germany because uh, it comes also the the research and development and all the all the innovative things are coming together. So so they they will I, I guess they will keep it more in their home countries than to so so in Slovakia Slovakia has a huge uh, uh, is a huge producer of SUVs uh, from Volkswagen each year so so I I don't see in a, 
uh, in the near future that this will uh, change. Uh, and also Slovakian government is not very much in favor of uh, the electric cars now. And uh, our minister of economy, uh, he's, he said that the future is in hydrogen and then that we have to focus concerning research and development more on the hydrogen solution for the individual transport. Uh, so, so this is also, and what was the second question? I forgot. And are there generally incentives for the development of renewables? Uh, uh, I, I was I was talking because there was a great issue that we have this jump in renewables. So I was talking to many people from the from the sector, from the business of photovoltaics and stuff. And what what's their message to the government is that we don't need more incentives. Just uh, just get us like connected to the grid because this is the huge problem. That I think in the nowadays prices the renewables could be uh, competitive to um, to fossils, but the situation in Slovakia is, is stuck and uh, the grid is not open. So hopefully after implementing the clean energy package for all European, uh, the, the situation will be changed. Uh, there are uh, I, I don't know this is uh, this is like uh, like I'm curious about uh, is there any project in Armenia? I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it is. Uh, they are, uh, which are financed by European Investment Bank or by the European Bank for uh, Reconstruction. Are there any, do you know about the uh, investment of in Armenia? Because I know in Georgia, there is a huge uh, amount of investment in the hydropower sector, but... Uh, well, I suppose some uh, elements of the European Green Deal sh should be incorporated in the comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement between Armenia and the EU. No, no, I mean the, the European Investment Bank. You know that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if not, okay. About the investment as well. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, in Georgia, it's interesting because there is also a large movement against building new yeah, large yeah. hydropower there because some people think that they will lose some lands just in order that some uh, government related oligarch may do some uh, bitcoin or something mining mm -hmm. yes so uh, it's uh, a, a big discussion issue now in georgia yeah yeah i know and also in slovakia uh, the the plan for the previous government was to build uh, huge amount of uh, small uh, hydropower plants, uh, but really our, I, I think our rivers cannot compare to yours rivers <laughs> or to Georgian rivers. Uh, so, so there was a huge movement against, the, against uh, these um, policies. Uh, and now we are in a state that uh, the, 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 it stopped uh, to build more um, small hydropower plants because it has, we must admit it has a, a huge environmental impact on, on river when the um, power plants are built, for example, five kilometers, uh, one of, you know, one every one, uh, every five kilometers each, so. Uh, well, the, yeah, there are some small hydropower plants in Armenia as well. Mm -hmm. Still, uh, some of them were connected to the previous government because the independent producers had the problem of getting access to the grid or had to pay for that. So mm -hmm. It's a bit more different now, but still this sector is not developing that fast. Mm -hmm. as it was, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, maybe the lessons learned could be don't go that way. <laughs> Uh, go to solar and uh, as I mentioned in the case uh, case one is that uh, the, 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 the government should be really careful about how the incentives are set to avoid the speculations because the speculation also don't, didn't happen on, only in Slovakia, it happened also in the Czech Republic and when this speculation happened once 
there is a like uh, the, the, there is a stop for solar for next 15 years you know just because um, that incentives were not um, set right in the right way well, uh, solar has been on the rise in Armenia as well slowly but in the energy sector probably the fastest the fastest growing mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Wind, uh, not so much mm -hmm. yet. Uh, wind may require a larger investment, probably that's the issue because with solar, some even private homeowners can make an installation on their roofs of, on the roofs of greenhouses. Some agricultural producers can do that and also on the roofs of storage buildings or industrial buildings with uh, wind mm -hmm. it still uh, seems more difficult although there were some proposals to develop that sector as well but mm -hmm. no feasible investment has arrived yet mm -hmm. uh, in europe also concerning the renewables uh, there is a question of this hydrogen i mentioned uh, earlier uh, because uh, the commission is uh, wants to deploy the, the, the hydrogen really like widely, but uh, uh, the commission is talking about the green hydrogen. So uh, coming from the renewables and now we don't have simply enough. It is like, I don't know how many, 14 times more uh, uh, renewables needed till 2030 to like uh, to be uh, produced to really stick to the plan that commission have with, for example, this hydrogen. So yeah, this is uh, another things. And I think uh, my, my main, uh, main message of this presentation, and I hope that uh, also the, the European policies will go that direction is that the energy and efficiency is the really the, the, the first thing we should think of when we are talking about the, the emission reduction and the energy consumption reduction. So this is really, really important. Yeah, and especially in Slovakia, and it's the easiest way, easiest way how to reduce the emissions. Uh, thank you. And now uh, I would like to ask our participants to ask if they have questions. Please use this opportunity. We still have some. Uh, yes, please. I should speak with the microphone or not? Uh, uh, yeah, better to use the microphone because. Don't get something else. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this unique uh, presentation. Um, first of all, I want to uh, introduce myself. My name is Vardan and I am a student at Yerevan State University. But I have a question. I want to know when we speak about climate changes, should we cooperate the powers of countries uh, to struggle against the climate um, changes or uh, we should uh, fight uh, in local level? Uh, to be more effective, what do you think about that? Uh, so if I understood correctly, because the sound was a little bit breaking, uh, if we should focus more on the uh, international co cooperation than uh, like solving the issue on the regional level, was that right or? I don't know. Yes, so national level or cooperation. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, we can do we can do uh, on the on the regional level uh, only that which is allowed on the national level. So so this is kind of complementary uh, levels. Uh, for example, in Austria, they are co they are really like uh, I, I'm really like. Uh, jealous on them because uh, they have uh, these um, uh, energy communities in the towns and villages so they will they put uh, together the money by the wind turbine for example 
And then they will wait 12, 15, 20 years. Uh, they are selling the energy uh, electricity to the grid and they, they are like, like have this money for further improvement of, of the village. They are not uh, have the personal profit from that, but they are uh, like uh, improving their village and uh, they make insulation um, and stuff like that. So uh, it's good always to push uh, the government <laughs> to, to, to allow you to have this, but on the other hand, it's very important to organize on the, on the local level, of course. So that's uh, that would require higher level subsidiarity, I guess, and less paperwork and red tape regarding uh, permissions. Yeah. So if each village uh, should be able to decide about a windmill. Yes, and also, uh, for example, in Slovak, there is one obstacle which is not we we can overcome in terms of this. Uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, community energy stuff is that we have something like a debt break that, for example, the municipality cannot borrow more money uh, than is certain level. So, so with this investment, it's, it's not possible. I mean, the huge investment among municipalities are not possible because of this uh, debt break hey well you know so 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 yeah uh so so but but the, in austrian case uh, there is important that, that the people have the opportunity to connect to the grid and sell the electricity and then receive something back uh which is not possible in slovakia now okay, thank you other questions And how about uh, um, re the reduction of uh, dependence on gas supply? Mm -hmm. Because in 2009, I remember this was an issue, and in the winter, yeah. Uh, uh, we are still reduce, uh, now with the LPG terminals in Poland and oh. Croatia and the interconnectivity. Uh, how does it work? Uh, it works great for the gas uh, for the gas companies. <laughs> LNG terminals uh, were built, uh, but uh, there are voices that there is already overcapacity for gas in Europe. If we having in mind the climate targets uh, from coming from the Green Deal, so. Uh, for example, there is now a really huge issue about this Nord Stream 2 uh, to Nord Stream 2 uh, pipeline. Uh, and uh, there are many like people from the European Parliament, but also from the NGO sector who are saying that, come on, we, we are over, we are really like over capacities uh, in gas. Uh, because we are building one more pipeline for Azerbaijan from the south uh, through Turkey uh, and really it's like we are oversupplied. And uh, what happened uh, when the COVID came is that these LNG terminals were full and nobody wanted the gas. So, so I think uh, the gas companies really try to uh, to, to keep it like going, the business like usual, but uh, I think in a, in a longer term view, it's, it will be not possible. And uh, it, they are like thinking like 10, in 10 years, we, will, we could phase it out of uh, this um, uh, gas, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> addiction, uh, but, the thing is that, for example, uh, when the recovery instruments came in Slovakia, uh, the gas, uh, the gas, uh, like companies said, like, uh, you know, we have to use this money to improve our air quality, and we have a bad air quality because uh, we are uh, using coal and we are using biomass. So let's uh, let's change all the boilers. Uh, 
in uh, in the households or, or in the um, uh, district heating uh, for the gas boilers. Uh, and now the question is, should we this rally um, this money really be spending on the really old style gas infrastructure? So, so this is really like now discussing and uh, the European Commission has um, uh, ambivalent attitude to their gas. Uh, they are saying that it's supposed to be like bridge fuel uh, towards climate neutrality or, uh, you know, the, the bridge, um, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, but, um, the, question, the, the, the other side uh, of the uh, discussion is that they are asking, people are asking if it is a good solution, why we are not uh, like putting more investment into the, into the renewable, into the development of renewable market, because it's not developed enough. So, so this, is the, this is the question of this. I don't know, uh, how is it in Armenia? Is there any uh, similar questions like this? Well, uh, uh, the proposals to build a new nuclear plant uh, could not be realized, so it requires a huge investment, so the old one is uh, refurbished and uh, mm -hmm. extended, and uh, we want to develop renewables, but still uh, there is no option for phasing out gas at this moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, yeah, same in Slovakia. Uh, mm -hmm. Regarding gas, I think there's still some growth project in Germany with gas consumption because they are committed to phasing out nuclear plants in short term. The, both coal and nuclear, so gas is uh, has still a room for growth there. And Germany is a huge yeah, I mean, I mean, gas is in, in the European level, gas is like approved as okay from the side of the Commission. On the other hand, uh, European Parliament uh, is more, more like uh, reluctant to, to have this positive attitude. But uh, uh, as I mentioned, the European Investment Bank, which is the um, uh, biggest. Uh, world lender, public lender. It's a bank of European Union, European Investment Bank. And uh, the president of the bank said clearly that gas is over and there will be no more investment uh, into the gas pipelines uh, from 2021, I guess. Uh, so, so, so the question is not what the countries want, but also where the financial market is heading. And when, in a case when this uh, really big public bank is saying such a statement, it means that also the private banks will start to, to rethink their investment in, in gas. So, 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 so this is also in a movement. The, 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 the financial sector is really now focusing on renewables and uh, sustainable investments and stuff like that, because it seems that there will be a stranded assist, assets uh, when they will continue with financing of the fossils. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so another opportunity to questions comments or we should finish in a few minutes in any case so this is still the final opportunity perhaps if there are no questions uh, i would like to thank you Irene, for your presentation and uh, following discussion and if possible please uh, send the presentation file to me as yeah, well sure. mm -hmm. and uh, this will be useful and we will have uh, some other events on the same topic with other experts from other V4 countries. So, uh, and then uh, we may
produce a paper for our Armenian policymakers with some recommendations and we hope to have an impact on policymaking in this field, hopefully. And uh, thank you very much again. And I'll be in contact with you with some technical issues. And okay. now uh, have a nice day. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be, be there, be here with you. Uh, and um, I'm happy <laughs> to to discuss with anybody. So if you maybe uh, come out, come to some to me with some interesting story from Armenia, I will I will be really happy to cover it also in my articles. <laughs> so yeah, anytime. Yeah. And I will I will also send you my uh, contact for the participants if they would be interested. Yes, uh, well, maybe we can exchange some thoughts which uh, aspects of the situation in Armenia would be more interesting. So you might make suggestions so we would prepare some material because uh, the Iraq TV is a part of the whole, uh, it's not just a Slovakian website, yeah. it's a part of a whole EU network. So there's a Iraq TV in each EU member country. And this may be also a good opportunity to reach the entire community. Yeah, yeah. We have we have the we are based in Brussels, so uh, covering all possible geopolitical issues. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a, any any kind of interesting informations are good to know. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank let's you. stay in touch. Have a nice day. You too. Bye bye. bye.